Hey everybody, it's Dr. May. So welcome to another episode of Sensory Motor Psychotherapy. I'm going to go through a really cool skill today, um, concept rather, um, called the window of tolerance. Okay, um, it's really kind of helps you to understand yourself better and your reactions to things. So um, let's get right to it. Not sure if you've heard of this before, but they actually have a very nice way of explaining it in um, sensory motor psychotherapy. So kind of looking forward to showing that to you today. All right, so this one's called neuroception and the window of tolerance. All right, so I hope you're not scared off by the big word here. So let's just start out by talking about neuroception, right? So if you think about neuro, it has to do with your nervous system. Inception has to do with the way we perceive something, right? When we say perception, we perceive things with our five senses. Neuroception has to do with the way our nervous system, through our senses, perceives danger and safety, right? So we kind of always are unconsciously assessing the things that we're coming into contact with in our environment, including things, people, and even our internal sensations. And our brain is comparing it to things from the past and trying to decide if now it's dangerous, it's safety, or it's neutral, right? And even, or if it's life-threatening, rather. And in response to our perception of that or neuroception of that, we automatically have a level of arousal that happens, right? So it could be a high level of arousal when you feel really revved up and ready for fight or flight, or a really low level of arousal when you almost like are freezing or fainting or playing dead or a comfortable level of arousal, which they call the window of tolerance, okay? And our, our body selects these levels of arousal because it's trying to help us survive and adapt to whatever situation we're in, okay? So that's pretty much the goal of what neuroception is for, right, is to help us survive. Okay, so what is the window of tolerance, okay? So when we think about tolerance, it's about putting up with something. It's about getting through something, enduring, um, being able to survive something, get through it, right? So there's a, a optimal level of arousal that's comfortable for us that we get into when we feel safe. And that's what they call the window of tolerance, okay? So see this diagram here. I want you to imagine that there's a window that opens this way, okay? And the top piece of the window that says, ah, too much, is the hyper arousal part. And the bottom part of the window is the hypo arousal part, okay? And the part in the middle is the open window. And that's the part that where we feel our comfortable zone, all right? So when we're in the hyper arousal part, that's when we feel like we're really revved up. So we feel things such as panic, overwhelm, anger, anxiety. We really feel the blood pumping, the adrenaline. Our thoughts are racing. We're in fight, flight, and freeze. We call for help. We're, we're in a mobilized response mode. So we're, we're reacting to danger in a mobilized, active kind of a way, okay? Or a, or a neuroception of danger, okay? On the bottom, it says, oh, too much. We're still feeling completely overwhelmed. And when our body decides that fighting back or fleeing or run away isn't going to help us, we kind of go into play dead mode. So we freeze like a deer in the headlights. So we're activated on the inside, but we don't move or we completely shut down and fold and collapse. And so this part feels like very numb, low energy, a sluggish, withdrawn, um, not very social, depressed, okay? So that low energy mode is hypo arousal, okay? So in between that is the window of tolerance. So here they say it's smoother sailing, okay? So here's where we feel safe. So we're neurocepting safety. So we feel like, okay, I can let my hair down. I could relax a little bit. I'm more at ease. Like I can communicate with people. I can be socially engaged and comfortable. I can rest and digest. I could just, you know, enjoy myself and be okay. So that's the window of tolerance. And it's usually, it feels much more comfortable than the hyper arousal or hypo arousal. Okay. So I like to think of these space rings as like, kind of like Goldilocks and the three bears. So I know not everybody knows this story, but basically it's a children's story where Goldilocks finds this house in the woods that happens to belong to three bears, a mama bear, a papa bear, and a baby bear. So she goes in and she sees some porridge on the table 
and one is too hot and one is too cold and one is just right. And there's some other versions that say one is too big, one is too small, one is just right. So there's different you know, scenarios. Then she sees three chairs and one is too big, one is too small and one is just right. Then she sees three beds and one is too hard, one is too soft and one is just right. Okay, so that's kind of like the window of tolerance. So the hyperarousal part is like the too much arousal when I feel like too revved up. The hypoarousal is like too little where I feel like too dead inside. And the window of tolerance is just the right comfortable amount of energy that helps me feel safe and get through my day. All right, so let's talk about some common triggers for neurocepting danger. So what are the kind of things that get us into the hyperarousal or hypoarousal modes, okay? Because sometimes we're in those modes much more often than we prefer. So it's important for us to understand what's triggering that in us, what's leading our nervous system to decide that there's danger here, okay? So the obvious one, growing up especially, might have been physical or sexual abuse and trauma. Okay, so that literally makes us feel like our life is threatened or we're in great danger. Um, and when that happens and our attachment figures or parents or caregivers don't help us regulate our emotions, we just kind of spin out and we get very dysregulated, right? So either hyper aroused or hypo aroused. And sometimes we learn patterns of that based on the dangerous feelings we have that then carry into our lives going forward, even into adulthood, okay? Um, another thing that feels like danger to us is when people can be, are angry at us or they're criticizing us or disapproving of us or we feel like they're punishing us. And that might have really felt dangerous, especially if we were growing up, if that was coming from parents or teachers or coaches or people in positions of authority. And now even when we're older and we have more resources at our disposal, we still could have that old feeling of feeling terrified by getting criticized or feeling devastated by it in some way. Because, you know, if the people who were supposed to take care of us when we were little, our, our caregivers, didn't love us anymore or were mad at us, we felt like our world was falling apart, right? So we still get that old feeling, even in the here and now, even if it's just another adult or even if it's a kid, right? So um, it's, it's an old response that could be carrying through. Okay, what about, bottom left, caregivers are important people not paying attention to us, right? So that may not be a big production, but we could feel slighted or ignored or not paid attention to and feel like that's a terrible thing. I, I, maybe I'm being abandoned. Maybe they don't love me anymore. Maybe they're going to leave me, right? And we go through this whole spin about what that means. And we kind of get, you know, activated about that, right? We neurocept danger there. Other times a profound loss can do it, right? So that could be uh, through death, obviously, but also through a breakup of a relationship, a divorce, someone just moving away, um, or someone literally when we were a kid, let's say abandoning us, right? And so that felt very, like, I can't survive without this person, right? So especially if you have a tendency to have more like, you know, tight relationships and mesh relationships, you're very dependent on people. If it feels like someone could leave or, or left, it could feel devastating, it feel dangerous to our nervous system, okay? Um, also, um, another thing is that we may have grown up with a lot of pressure on us, right? So our adults in our life might have pressured us to get good grades or make the right sports team or get the right kind of achievements going, right? Join all the clubs, get ready for college or whatever it happened to be for you. And so there's this pressure to excel. And if you're not good enough or you don't make the cut, you feel like someone could just abandon you or someone's not gonna love you anymore. And that could feel dangerous to us, okay? so. What I want you to take away from this slide is that it's not always just the most obvious thing. Danger isn't just a tiger coming after you, right? It really could be a relational thing. You know, just the way we perceive how others are treating us or, you know, a break in relationship could feel dangerous to us at a deep level, okay? Even if we're not going to die. And at some level, it feels like we may, okay? So just to validate yourself if this is part of the things that trigger you. Okay, so faulty neuroception, or what I'll call false alarms. So as you might realize, just thinking about your own experience, that sometimes you perceive a situation to be dangerous and you get hyper aroused or hypo aroused as a result, but in reality, it's not dangerous. So perhaps like you're reacting to trigger now that's bringing up something from your past. 
right? So a small thing in the present could feel like a big deal because it was a big deal many years ago. And so we overreact and we unnecessarily get out of our window of tolerance and into this hyper arousal or hypo arousal response, okay? And if you had a history of trauma, chances are you might have a lot of false alarms now because there might be a lot of things that still trigger you, okay? So, um, but the problem is, as you probably can guess, it interferes with your current functioning, right? If you're always stressed out or if you're always overreacting, it's hard to function really well and, have, and enjoy your life. So why do I have a picture of a rope here? So there's an old story, I think it's a Buddhist story about um, someone who walks in the woods and swears he sees a snake and he gets really anxious and upset and, oh my God, fearful, oh my God, it's a snake, right? I, I could get stung by the snake, I get bitten, I could die, poison, right? But then he looks more closely and he realizes it's just a rope, right? So it, he thought something was dangerous, but in fact, it wasn't dangerous, okay? So we got to think about, do a self-reflection of in your own life, what are the ropes that you keep thinking are snakes, okay? It's kind of a deep question. Um, where do I falsely neurocept danger and threat? Okay, so write this down, think about that. Okay, so what's one of the goals we're gonna look at? So in order to enhance our quality of life, um, it helps to expand our window of tolerance. Okay, so let's look at the diagram on the left. So again, if you've had trauma, there's a good chance that your window of tolerance is small. So it doesn't take much to get you to overreact and assume there's danger, that your body just automatically neurocepts danger. So there's very limited situations where you might feel comfortable, right? Any little trigger might set you off one way or the other, okay? So it's hard to be in a variety of situations because there's a lot of things that might, you know, make you feel uncomfortable and, and triggered. So the goal is to expand a window of tolerance. So we could deal with more situations, and feel more comfortable more often, right? Without overreacting, without getting overly anxious, overly depressed, overly shamed, without getting into target behaviors or dangerous behaviors, right? So that there's a greater range of life that we're able to tolerate. So that's one of the main goals, right? And it helps us to function better in our life and relationships. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the different types, the danger, um, you know, and, and the, the, you know, all that kind of stuff, hyper arousal, hyper arousal window of tolerance, and talk about internal signals we're going to experience, and also actions we tend to experience. And so by being more aware of this, it helps us to be able to reflect on our current experience and know what state am I in right now? If you were to think about yourself at this moment, are you hyper aroused? Are you hypo aroused? Or are you in your window of tolerance? Okay, so this kind of helps us to be more mindful. It gives us more information to be looking for. All right, all right, so we're gonna start at the top from hyper arousal. So this is the internal signal. So this is what we might feel on the inside when we're hyper aroused. And as you can see in the center, I put four of the main building blocks. So we're going back to the building blocks that we started a few lessons ago, and we're gonna talk about how they play into hyper arousal. Okay, so starting with the top. So we'll start with thoughts. So when you're hyper aroused, your thoughts are impacted, okay? You might have a lot of racing thoughts. Your thoughts might be da 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 right? You might be obsessing about things, um, worrying about things over and over and over again, rehashing situations that were a problem for you over and over again because you're trying to figure it out, or you're trying to master it, or you're trying to redo something in your mind. Um, you might have difficulty concentrating, it might be hard to focus on reading. Um, it might be hard to focus in school or work. You might be easily distracted, okay? So it's not necessarily always what you're thinking. It's what's happening to your thoughts that could be significant. Um, body sensations. So again, we're hyper aroused. We're very um, you know, activated. So we're easily startled. We're jumpy, right? So we're easily looking out for danger, our orientation response, right? restless, fidgety, shaky, wound up and tense, and it could be hard to sleep, right? You could be so riled up that it's hard to fall asleep and relax. Um, emotions, um, think of fight or flight. So fight has to do with anger, flight has to do with fear. So you could be angry, enraged, irritated on the anger side, afraid, anxious, panicked, nervous, 
on the fearful side. Just otherwise, it's just a general sense of distress, um, uneasy, uncomfortable, unsafe, and easily overwhelmed. All right, so all that could kind of fall under the emotion category. And perhaps more things I forgot. Okay, and movements. So again, this is a mobilized response. So you likely have an a urge to run or leave or an urge to fight or attack. So fight or flight, okay? So before you actually do something, you might have the urge to do it, okay? But now we're gonna talk about the actual actions, okay? So the action is fight. You might literally fight with your fists or you might fight with your words, okay? You might um, run away or escape the situation, leave the room, get out of the premises, move away from the person that makes you uncomfortable, whatever that means for you. You might freeze up. So you're gonna feel revved up on the inside and tense and frozen on the outside. That's what the freeze is, right? Um, calling for help. So um, you, you might reach out for someone when you're feeling stressed out. So that's an important aspect of a mobilized response too. Other times you might try to keep yourself safe by doing what they call appease and please. So I'm gonna to try to make the person who's angry at me more happy so that the person doesn't attack me. Okay, so the boy in the picture is, I think, putting a blanket on his mother, maybe. So he keeps his mother calm so she doesn't yell at him, for example. Okay, so now, if you're hyper aroused on a regular basis, right, and if you had a history of trauma, you might be, you know, because your system kind of learns that response and it's very hard to calm down. So if your stress hormones are flowing on a regular basis and you're chronically hyper aroused, you might tend to always or frequently feel anxious, angry, frightened, on guard, pressured, impulsive, and physically tense, right? You might even have some chronic pain because you're tensing your muscles all the time. You might complain of headaches, back aches, neck aches, right? Okay. So now this is what we're going to call high arousal, but it's in the safety zone. So this is still in the window of tolerance, but your arousal is a little on the high side. Okay, because sometimes it is beneficial to us, even in a safe situation, to have a little bit more energy, right? It helps the situation go better. So, for example, if I'm participating in an athletic activity such as soccer or some other sport, it's good for me to have high energy and be have a little bit more arousal excitement, right? Um, if I'm, let's say, in a brainstorming session at work or school and I'm working with people and we're throwing ideas around, we're trying to, you know, work on a project it's good to be a little higher energy because it gets me into it, right? Um, if I'm doing chores or work, right? Some, some activities require more energy and more activity. So that's a high arousal safety. And if I'm engaging with people and social engagement, right? But we're having a stimulating, interesting conversation that might take a little more energy, but it feels good, okay? So it's not always a bad thing to have arousal. It's just whether or not you're perceiving danger versus safety. Okay, so here we go. Window of tolerance. Okay, so this is the optimal arousal. Um, so let's look at the internal signals for this. Okay, so when I'm in my window of tolerance, my mind is clear. Okay, I, I can access my thoughts. I could think things through carefully. Um, I have an open mind. Um, I can make better decisions. I'm good at handling challenges. I'm able to focus. I could concentrate, you know, so all of that is operating so much better than when I'm in high arousal, okay? Um, body sensations, my body is much more relaxed and calm and at peace, right? I can still have energy, but it generally feels good and relaxed. Emotions, so this is more of an open mind, so curious, engaged, interested, safe and secure, right? Feeling safe, you just really feel it in your bones that you're safe, you might feel centered, and feel more trust in yourself and your abilities. And movements, I feel like I have more control so I could respond instead of just react. I'm not just gonna go and fight or flight automatically. I'm gonna be able to planfully decide what I'm going to do, okay? So all you DBT fans out there, sounds a lot like wise mind, right? Yeah, and if you're a radically open DBT fan, this sounds a lot like the social safety system that we talk about a lot there. So there's a lot of overlap but here we're going to talk about this being our window of tolerance. All right, it's all kind of similar stuff. Okay, so now we're going to move down to a low arousal in a safety mode. All right, so sometimes we feel very calm and very relaxed and low arousal, but it's a good thing. 
right? So if I wanna do yoga or meditation, it's kind of nice when my body's calmed down. Or if I'm just sitting calmly by myself and a Sunday morning and I'm reading or having a cup of coffee, just sitting in nature, just very relaxed, pleasant, right? Sitting in front of a fireplace, just listening to soft music, trying to chill out, or if I'm trying to go to sleep, right? It helps if I have a low arousal, all right? And that's a positive thing in these situations. All right, but now when we're hypo aroused, when it's too low and I'm perceiving danger and threat, this is what I experience on the inside, okay? So these are some of the clues we can look for to determine if we're in a hypo aroused state. All right, so thoughts. Now, I don't have much access to my thoughts. I feel much more spaced out. Like it's hard to even think. Um, it's hard to just gather my mind. So instead of racing thoughts like hyperarousal, it's just like, I feel a little more zoned out, a little more brain fog. I might just like uh, not even care that much, okay? Body sensations, all right? So this is the fold and play dead response. So it's kind of a relaxed, collapsed, deadened feeling. So I'm weak, I'm lethargic, sluggish, heavy, low energy. I might sleep too much, including during the day. All right, so think really like drained, emotion-wise. So I may not feel many emotions at all. And a lot of people are uncomfortable with that, right? Like I should be feeling something, but I'm not feeling anything. I feel numb, right? That's very typical of hypoarousal. And it doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It just means that your hypoarousal response is kicking in because your system neurocepted danger and threat. And that's a pattern that your body learned. So it learned to shut you down in order to protect you during a threatening situation. All right, so emotionally flat, dull, numb, empty, and dead, okay? You might be kind of like along the depression continuum, like depressed, disinterested, you don't care about things very much, you're indifferent, you're unmotivated, you're bored, you're, you're disconnected, um, just, you know, just don't really care about too much stuff. It's hard to get yourself going, hard to feel much, hard to have interest, okay? So all of this fits under the hypoarousal. Okay, so what are some actions associated with it? Well, not much. As you can see in the picture in the center, it's like a play dead response, right? So that dog is playing dead. Um, and if you look at the picture of the woman and the man, they're just like collapsed. They're just, oh, you know, um, so that's what the action is. We're just immobile and still. So if you feel very sluggish, like you, you don't want to move, like you just want to sleep all day, um, that's a sign you're hypo aroused, okay? All right, so if this occurs to you on a regular basis, like let's say your body just learned a hypoarousal response and it frequently kicks in whenever you neurocept danger and threat. So if that happens, you might be chronically lethargic, weary, dead, empty, flat, depressed. That might just be your typical norm. Um, and also your physiology slows down too, like you might have a slower heart rate and just numb body sensations, <clears throat> okay? And you might be disturbed by that, like what's wrong with me? All right, but again, it's the hypoarousal response. Okay, so now we're into the exercise portion. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some ways to better reflect and understand what state we're in and to how to improve our window of tolerance. Okay, so first, so this one's called signals of autonomic arousal. So basically we're gonna go through the different categories on the left that we just reviewed. And for each one, you're gonna try to think about or remember the five building blocks that you've experienced for each one. So what were the five building blocks when you were in hyper arousal, for example, or lower arousal, or high arousal safety, or hypo arousal threat? Like what's all the different ones that you've noticed, okay, for each category? And also you could kind of notice, let's say, what's the difference between, for you, how does it feel differently in those building blocks between hyper arousal and high arousal? You know, is there a difference physiologically in how it feels or with your emotions and thoughts? What about the difference between hypoarousal threat and low arousal safety, right? They're kind of close together, but they are a little different. So this helps us to kind of refine our, our perception of ourselves and kind of observe a little more carefully, all right? Okay, so now this one's gonna focus mostly on, um, whoops, triggers in regulating high or hyperarousal. Okay, 
So what are triggers that you could think of that tend to lead you into that hyperarousal danger state? Okay, so think about your life in general, maybe some recent times when you were there, and what are the kinds of things that trigger you? Okay, then describe the body signals that indicate you've been triggered in a hyperarousal or high arousal. And what tends to help you feel better in those situations? So are there skills you've used that helps you get back into your window of tolerance? So maybe you could think of some things that work for you already. And once you identify what they are, you could repeat them again in the future and maybe use them when you need them. Okay, so we're gonna flip it around. So now um, I want you to think about triggers for low or hypoarousal for you. So what are some things that tend to get you down that other end, okay? What are some body signals that are the clues that you're there? And then what helps bring you back into a window of tolerance? All right, so just take some notes on that. You can write this in your journal. So again, this is to increase our awareness of these different states and what helps. Okay, so now, um, so this one's called understanding your neuroception. So this is more about people and situations that are associated with those different states. So what kind of people and situations for you are associated with danger, hypoarousal danger, window of tolerance, and hypoarousal threat, okay? So think about, is it different for each one? Is it the same kind of thing? What varies? Um, and in general, do you tend to be in one category more than another? Like, are you somebody who tends to always be kind of dead inside and hypoaroused? Like, is that your norm? Or are you kind of more of a nervous hyperarousal person that's always running around and anxious, right? What, what's your typical? So just to kind of, you know, identify that. And do you think you're prone to faulty neuroception, right? So are the things that trigger you to get into those states uh, kind of false alarms, right? Do you tend to perceive danger where there isn't any and then you get all revved up about it? Okay, so, so just identify what it is without judging it one way or the other, okay? Don't be like, oh no, I'm overreacting. Don't worry about it. It is what it is. We're just kind of understanding ourselves better. Okay, here's another interesting thing you could try if you want to. All right, so let's say um, for a few days, each day you're going to set up yourself a graph like this. And as the day goes on, you're just going to track your arousal. So if you look at the left, I have the different categories of the window of tolerance, right? The hyperarousal, high arousal, window of tolerance low arousal and hypoarousal. So upon like waking up, where are you on that graph? Then early morning, reassess yourself. Okay, where's my arousal level now? And put like a little dot on the graph approximately. And do that for all the different segments of the day that are list listed here. And you could do this um, for like a few days in a row and then look at it and notice if there's any patterns. Like do you, have to, do you happen to have like a dip in energy around two o'clock in the afternoon? Or do you tend to be really revved up at 10 a.m.? Or you know, do you really wind down around 7 p.m. and that's kind of like leading you toward your bedtime? Okay, so maybe you have a pattern that you tend to have, okay? And so once you look at your patterns, think, you know, am I happy with this pattern? You know, is this where I want my arousal to be? Or am I hoping it could be a little differently? Like, let's say, you know, I had that dip at 2 p.m., but I really would prefer to have a little bit more energy because I need to finish work and I don't get out of work till five o'clock, all right? So, or, you know, maybe there's some things we could do to tweak that once we realize what the patterns are, okay? But at least if we're aware of it, we know where we could direct our energy. Okay, so the last one, so this one's called recognizing optimal arousal, okay? So here's focusing on our window of tolerance. So we, we're gonna end on a high note. So think about what are the things that lead you to be in your window of tolerance? Right? Is it being around certain people? Is it thinking certain things? Is it being in certain activities? Is it being by yourself? Like, what is it that helps you in your window of tolerance? Because once we identify that, then we could maybe be in our window of tolerance more. We could do that more, right? Um, so um, think about maybe three moments in your life where you were in the window of tolerance, and you know what what led to that. You know, so maybe that'll help you identify. Um, and so as you think about those moments of optimal arousal in your window of tolerance, just kind of really put yourself there, right? What are those recent events? What was happening? What was I feeling? What, what, was, what were the people around doing? And once you really get yourself there, try to identify which, of the, which five building blocks were activated in you and how, okay? What's happening to your thoughts as this 
is brought to mind? What's happening to your emotions as the window of tolerance is brought to mind for you? And just write some of those things down, those, some of those observations, okay? And then think about, okay, so now that we identified this, what can I do to be in the window of tolerance more frequently? So that window could open up a little bit more. Okay. All right. So there you have it. Window of tolerance. All right. So I hope you stay in your window and have a good day and um, I'll see you the next time. Okay. Bye guys.